principal sir you, you have joined us right in the post covid 19 world uh, from soft for diplomacy to full for your diplomacy so a very uh, relevant topic in uh, today's time uh, so uh, i welcome you all to this uh, platform uh, ramon uh, professor uh, uh, ramon low yeah, he has done his phd uh, from australia and uh, presently he is uh, a lecturer at the history department of hong kong baptist university So uh, it is here. Really, uh, so we welcome you. So now I will request our uh, vice principal, sir, Dr. Ramesh Kaur, to formally welcome him, and uh, then uh, you can uh, begin your lecture. So, sir, now it is over to you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Honourable our distinguished research persons and dignitaries, dear colleague. Research scholar, participant, beloved, convener, joint convener, program coordinators, and exceptional students. It is really a great pleasure and privilege to be present through online in the. international webinar organized by the students of political science and history with collaboration our college iqc cell being the head of the institute i must congratulate the teachers of the department of political science and history especially dr samin ramon mishas joint convener and professor jatonu maji convener Respond in one. 
schedule. I have under my best wishes to our governing body for moral support to organize this seminar. I sincerely believe that these kinds of seminar surely a new surely a, a new sight uh, to the our students and also uh, our teachers. The cerebral exchange of ideas and views would enable our teaching learning method much more tangible and palatable. I wish one success of the this seminar. Once again, thanking you all. Good night, Dr. Trump, again. So uh, now, uh, Dr. Raymond, you can uh, start your uh, special, uh, you can deliver your lecture. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the, Dr. Maji, can I just ask how I can share my PowerPoint slides? Uh, just please see, there is an option called present now, okay? On the right hand side of your screen. Yeah. Yeah, just click on that. And... So which item should I choose? Uh, share your entire screen. Share my, okay, your entire screen. Yeah. Okay, just yeah. New history. Hong Kong. So, uh, 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 Professor Ramon, just a minute. So, uh, I would like to request you all, please don't click on the present now button. Only, uh, otherwise this uh, presentation will get disrupted. So, I will kindly request you all not to click on the present now button. Especially, I am uh, asking our students, don't click on the present now button, okay? So can can you guys see my PowerPoint slides now? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Uh, please uh, maximize the screen, okay? Okay. Like this? Yeah. Okay. So everyone can see, correct? Yeah, we can see. Go ahead, okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, distinguished. Uh, scholars, uh, experts, students, uh, a very good uh, afternoon. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Maji, uh, your very kind uh, invitation and also your very generous uh, introduction. I'm really happy to be here on this occasion uh, to share some of my uh, preliminary observations uh, of uh, China's uh, foreign relations. Uh, particularly in the uh, post COVID-19 world. Um, so, uh, to begin with... So, so think... just, uh, please uh, click on the present now button once again, okay, because your screen has got uh, minimized. What about now? Is it working now? Uh, no, it's still minimized. I think I think you need to click on the present now button uh, once more. Okay. Uh, 
And now? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully it works. Uh, first of all, my apologies, but uh, because actually I'm still trying to uh, get myself uh, familiarized with, with this uh, rapid thing. Okay, probably I am one of the, the least, uh, I mean, technologically, I mean, one of the most in the technologically inept persons. So, anyway, so please uh, bear with me. Uh, okay, so as I said, uh, what I would like to do uh, for this. Uh, lecture okay, is about sharing my preliminary observation of the foreign policy making uh, in China. Uh, my focus of attention in particular would be uh, about the dramatic shift uh, of what can be uh, known as the soft power diplomacy uh, under the former president Hu Jintao okay, to the emergence of the so-called wolf Warrior uh, diplomacy under President uh, Xi Jinping. Okay, I think as uh, many of you may be aware of this, uh, particularly since uh, Xi Jinping came into power in 2013, uh, the Chinese government has become a lot, or increasingly has become a lot more uh, assertive, uh, on, on some occasions aggressive. Uh, so, this is the phenomenon uh, which I think is worth exploring. I mean, in terms of this increasingly aggressive stance okay, being taken by the Chinese uh, foreign ministry uh, against some of the uh, major powers, in particular the United States, Australia, and some other uh, countries. And this increasingly aggressive stance being taken by the Chinese foreign uh, ministry is being uh, commonly known as the so-called wolf warrior uh, diplomacy with the phrase being uh, widely used okay, in the uh, Chinese state-run media as well as some uh, Western publications. In many ways, okay, this emergence of this uh, so-called wolf warrior diplomacy has stood in stark contrast okay, with the uh, Chinese government's uh, cultivation of the soft power diplomacy uh, during the uh, early to the mid-2000s under President Hu Jintao. Okay, in terms of understanding uh, the essence of the rationale behind the wolf, so-called wolf warrior diplomacy here, I would like to first of all show you guys uh, a, a very prominent example, a very iconic figure okay, in, within the Chinese government. Okay, his name is, as you guys can see, is called uh, Zhao Li Jian. So he is currently the uh, spokesperson, uh, the spokesperson uh, for of uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry, and this is his official Twitter account. And perhaps, as you guys can read, right? Uh, basically, uh, the message that Mr. Chow was trying to convey here is about spreading a so-called conspiracy theory. Uh, in terms of uh, playing the blame game right, by accusing the U.S. of uh, uh, being uh, the the one okay, who has brought this uh, uh, COVID nineteen epidemic okay, to Wuhan city, and so I mean it's perhaps not not very surprisingly okay uh, this uh, Twitter message okay, being. Uh, conveyed by Mr. Chow has aroused a, a strong sense of um, controversy uh, among the, uh, uh, the U.S. and also the English-speaking world. Um, so, again, what I would like to do uh, in this context uh, for this lecture today is I'm trying to do two things. First is to making sense of this dramatic shift Okay, in the pattern of China's foreign policy making. So, uh, as I said, uh, my particular focus of attention here is about understanding why suddenly, uh, under President Xi Jinping, why China is resorting to such an assertive and somewhat aggressive uh, uh, stance okay, in its foreign policy making. And second is, is I'm um, trying to offer some uh, possible explanation for 
uh, Beijing's motives okay, in, in terms of this uh, dramatic foreign policy change and what are some of the uh, probable implications uh, for China's uh, foreign, policy, uh, foreign relations in the post-COVID-19 world. So the argument that I'm trying to make uh, here is that uh, the shift from the so-called soft power diplomacy under President Hu Jintao to the so-called wolf warrior diplomacy uh, under President Xi Jinping does represent a radical departure from the traditional Chinese foreign policy. Okay, and this very dramatic change of foreign policy direction of Beijing, uh, I, as I argue, is attributed to uh, two, two factors. First is about uh, Beijing's efforts to demonstrate its uh, growing confidence um, on the world stage. And second is about uh, facilitating uh, President Xi Jinping's okay, his so-called Chinese dream of uh, national rejuvenation. I'm going to dig deeper into uh, into this uh, in a sec. So uh, what I'm going to cover for today, uh, we're trying to do four things. Uh, first is we are going to make sense of some of the uh, rationale and traditions of China's foreign policy uh, making since 1949, since the establishment of the People's Republic of China. Okay, and second is about making sense of the uh, relations relationship okay, between uh, the Chinese world views and the Chinese foreign policy making. In my opinion, uh, it is crucial for us to, first of all, understand how the Chinese sees the world before we can make sense of the uh, rationale uh, behind the foreign policy making in China. And third is about... Uh, uh, it's about uh, making sense of exploring okay, this uh, cultivation okay, of the so-called soft power diplomacy under uh, President Hu Jintao. And last but not least, we are going to look into okay, this emergence of okay, uh, so-called wolf warrior diplomacy under uh, Xi Jinping. Okay, I think as many of you uh, again may be aware of this, uh, since the establishment of the People's uh, Republic of China, uh, the emphasis uh, of foreign policy making in China has always been placed on the so-called twin principles of non-intervention in the domestic affairs of uh, other countries, as well as the non-use of military force. Uh, again, these uh, twin principles uh, of China's foreign policy making uh, is best illustrated by the sayings of uh, the then Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao. Uh, this is what he said in a quote. Okay, no country has the right to impose its will on others, nor can it undermine or deny other countries' sovereignty under whatever excuse. Okay, to put it more accurately, okay, the principles guiding the foreign policy making in China since 1949 uh, can be understood as the so-called five principles of uh, peaceful coexistence. And this, this so-called five principles of uh, peaceful coexistence are as follow. First, mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. And second, mutual non-aggression. Third, non-interference in each other's internal affairs. Fourth, equality and mutual benefit. And fifth, peaceful coexistence. Okay, these five principles uh, was first set forth by Zhou Enlai, okay, the, the, uh, the premier of the time, uh, in his talks in Beijing with the Indian uh, delegation at the start of the negotiation that took place uh, from December 1953 to April 1954, between the representatives of the uh, Chinese and the Indian governments. And later, okay, these so-called five principles okay, were formally written into the preface to the agreement between the People's Republic of China and the Republic of India on trade and intercourse between the Tibet region of China and India. And later on, okay, these contents of these five principles were further extended 
into the so-called Ten Principle of Bandung, uh, which is being adopted at the 1955 uh, Bandung Conference. Uh, because of the time constraint, I'm not going to take uh, too deep uh, into this, but what I would like to say at this stage is this so-called Five Principles of uh, Peaceful Coexistence has long been the cornerstone uh, guiding the foreign policy making of China since uh, its establishment in 1949. Uh, in terms of further understanding uh, the rationale and traditions of uh, the foreign policy making in China, uh, here I think uh, even uh, Mandaros, I think probably many of you may, may have heard of his name, a very prominent, well renowned uh, 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 scholar. Right? Uh, this is the uh, think tank report that he has written for the rank uh, corporation in 2009. So, in this think tank report entitled China's International Behavior, uh, activism, optimism, and diversification. Uh, he argues that uh, there are three lens that may help explaining uh, China's state behaviors uh, from time to time. Again, okay, land number one is the national revitalization. So accordingly, uh, China is currently in the process of reclaiming its status as a major region, regional power and eventually as a great power. So in this sense, uh, if we are trying to understand uh, again what the so-called China dream means uh, in the eyes of President Xi Jinping, so being basically here is uh, what China now is doing is not about becoming a superpower or a great power, but this is about restoring its status as a great power like before, okay, at least like before uh, 1840s. Okay, land number two is the, uh, what can be known as a victim mentality. Even, even until today, uh, many Chinese people still view their country as a victim of uh, the Western imperialism or uh, in what can be also known as the so-called a century or 100 years of shame and uh, humiliation. At the, uh, at the hands of the Western and other foreign powers, especially Japan. And that also partially explains why uh, the Chinese government has attached the importance uh, of the transfer of sovereignty of Hong Kong uh, from the British to the Chinese in 1907. Right? Because uh, the, this so-called uh, handover, uh, with Hong Kong being uh, 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 resume uh, under the Chinese rule. What it represents is about ending okay this so-called uh, 100 years of shame and humiliation at the hands of the uh, Western imperialists. Okay, and land number three is the so-called defensive security outlook, which stems from the historically determined fears that foreign powers will try to constrain and coerce it by exploiting its internal weaknesses. So, uh, in this sense, uh, there are three diplomatic priorities, uh, according to even uh, Mendoros, mm -hmm. that help shaping China's foreign policy making. First is about protecting its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Okay, second is about promoting the economic development of China, and this has become particularly important and crucial since uh, 1978, since the launch of the reform and uh, opening door policy uh, by Deng Xiaoping. So, uh, priority number three is about generating international respect and status. So this is the three uh, diplomatic priorities, uh, which I think is we have to bear in mind before we can understand this uh, dramatic shift uh, of uh, foreign policy between China from soft power diplomacy to uh, so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. Okay, now, so let us turn into uh, the world wheels, right? The Chinese ways of seeing the world. Again, uh, quoting from the same uh, think tank report uh, being written by Evans Mandros, uh, the China's international behavior. Uh, there are some six narratives which are worth uh, paying attention to in terms of understanding how uh, the Chinese see the world. The first 
is about a century of shame and humiliation. Second, without the Chinese Communist Party, our new modern China could not and wouldn't exist. Third, the will of cultural characteristics as being inherent and unchanging. Fourth, we Chinese are uniquely unique. Fifth, history is destiny. And number six, notions of filial piety and uh, familial obligation. In my opinion, uh, narratives one, two, four, and five like, are particularly important for us to make sense of um, the uh, again the so-called Chinese worldviews and the foreign and the and its relations relationship with the uh, foreign policy making in China. Okay, and talking about uh, the importance of uh, the leadership of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, for those of you who are being familiar uh, with the uh, Chinese uh, constitution, uh, the leadership role, okay, the leadership role of the Chinese Communist Party is being written black and white in the constitution as the only one and one uh, legal ruling party okay, uh, of China. And although you may argue that there are some sort of, or some kinds of uh, so-called democratic parties in China, but the thing is, under no circumstances could those so-called democratic parties become the ruling party of China. Because the thing is, or the fact is, uh, the Chinese Communist Party would always be the only uh, uh, legal and ruling party uh, for the country. And I think important here perhaps is also uh, this uh, so-called New China. Right? I, 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 I'm referring to this People's Republic of China, but uh, the CCP always claims okay, this regime as a so-called New China. And so the, 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 the rationale behind here is uh, this so-called New China would, wouldn't and couldn't exist okay, without the leadership role being played by the Chinese Communist Party. So now, okay, let us uh, turn into the uh, soft power uh, diplomacy uh, under uh, President uh, Xi uh, uh, Hu Jintao. Uh, this cultivation okay, of so-called soft power diplomacy did not actually become uh, the official policy until uh, 2007. So it in other words, it was not until the year of 2007 that for the very first time, uh, the phrase soft power was being mentioned uh, by the uh, Chinese government. So here in this context, particularly important here perhaps is uh, President Hu Jintao's his, uh, advocacy, his advocacy of uh, building uh, Chinese soft power. Uh, during his uh, address, his uh, remarks uh, to the 17th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. Okay, so this is what he said, and I quote. Okay, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation will definitely be accompanied by the thriving of Chinese culture. We must enhance culture as part of the soft power of our country. Okay, we will further publicize the fine traditions of Chinese culture and strengthen international cultural exchange to enhance the influence of Chinese culture worldwide. So as I mentioned for the very first time, again, the phrase uh, soft power is being mentioned and written black and white again, in the official documents of the Chinese government. Okay, on another occasion, uh, this is also what uh, President, uh, President Hu Jintao said, and I quote, okay, We must clearly see that international hostile forces are intensifying the strategic plot of westernizing and dividing China, and ideological and cultural fields are the focal areas of their long-term infiltration. The international culture of the West is strong, why we are weak. So in this sense, uh, if we are trying to understand the uh, rationale behind uh, President Hu Jintao's advocacy of building 
so-called Chinese soft power. Uh, a very important purpose uh, that President Hu Jintao was trying to achieve here is about counterbalancing uh, the so-called Western influence over China. Because according, right, or in the eyes of the Chinese government, uh, what is uh, needed, uh, what the Chinese government needs to avoid is about, again, in the words of uh, Hu Jintao, it's about avoiding this strategic plot uh, of the West, right, to weaken, okay, or to divide China, while China uh, is uh, in its path of economic development. So, uh, talking about the sources, okay, uh, in terms of where the sources of uh, China soft power lies, uh, in many ways, uh, what the Chinese government is doing is pretty much following uh, the uh, Joseph Noy's concept, right, or his understanding of uh, soft power. I think, mean, uh, again, I mean, many of you, I'm sure uh, you guys may be uh, uh, aware, right, of uh, this so-called soft power concept being firstly advocated by Joseph Nye, right, which basically, again, right, refers to the ability, right, the ability of a uh, country, or, I mean, the ability to get what you want through attraction, Okay, rather than cohesion or, or payments, but so this is perhaps the simplest understanding of what soft power means. And according to Joseph Nye, right, uh, the soft power of a country lies in its uh, culture, its foreign policy making, and its political system. So, in many ways, uh, what the Chinese government is doing is pretty much as a following okay, the, the rationale behind uh, Joseph Nye's thinking. So accordingly, uh, the first, also the most important source of China's soft power lies in its culture. And accordingly, uh, the very first uh, Chinese article being written on elaborating uh, the importance of soft power was written by uh, Mr. Wang <coughs> Huning. Uh, Wang Huning, as you guys can see here on the right hand side, uh, in this picture, uh, he was being known uh, as perhaps the most important uh, strategist of uh, the President uh, Jiang Zemin. So uh, this is an article being written by Mr. Wang in 1993 that for the very first time uh, soft power has uh, appeared or has emerged okay, in the again, so Chinese speaking world. <laughs> so accordingly uh, some good values in the traditional Chinese cultures uh, are worth mentioning here, which could be understood as, uh, or which could be understood as crucial for the construction of China's uh, cultural soft power. For example, uh, winning respects through virtues, benevolent governance, peace and harmony, and also harmony without suppressing differences. So accordingly, okay, these are some of the good values which could be used for uh, promoting uh, the goodness, right, or the the, the strength of uh, Chinese culture, right, as the essence of the so-called uh, cultural soft power. Okay, and these efforts are okay, being made by the Chinese government to build its cultural soft power can be illustrated by the uh, construction or uh, by the uh, yeah, construction of the Confucius Institutes uh, across the world. I'm not sure if uh, I'm not sure if, if India has any uh, Confucius Institutes being installed. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, I think it is here yeah, very important in this context. It is very important, very important for us to understand the political agenda okay, behind this construction of this Confucius Institute's project across the world. Of course, right, uh, the first and foremost objective, okay, of building the Confucius Institute across the world is about projecting a relatively positive image of China to the outside world. Although this is somewhat ironic, right, because, I mean, if, if we can recall uh, the Cultural Revolution okay, during the uh, 
uh, Chairman Mao Zedong's period, right? Confucianism actually was uh, being uh, targeted uh, as the um, source of Ch uh, China's weakness. So, I mean, in the eyes of uh, Chairman Mao, uh, Confucianism or this uh, this ch traditional Chinese culture needs to be uh, removed in order for China to emerge as a new and strong power. But you see, somewhat ironically, now the Beijing authorities have found uh, Confucianism being useful right, in terms of promoting uh, uh, China's so-called cultural soft power. Again, okay, also, another particular agenda of the Confucius Institute is about advancing China's foreign policy goal of marginalizing Taiwan's international influence. So that has something to do with the uh, uh, the uh, diplomatic competition okay, between uh, Taipei and Beijing okay, since the conclusion of the Chinese uh, Civil War in uh, 1949. Okay, but because of the time constraint, I'm not going to uh, dig deep uh, into this uh, cross trade relations. Anyway, okay, second source of China's soft power lies in its uh, economic development. Like according to the Chinese government. Uh, again, since the launch of the reform and open door policy in 1978 uh, by Deng Xiaoping, okay, the emphasis uh, was uh, always being placed on the so-called one focus, two themes uh, guiding principle uh, by Deng Xiaoping. So one focus refers to the uh, economic development or economic modernization of China. Okay, the two themes refers to peace and development. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, in the eyes of uh, 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 Deng Xiaoping, the most important thing for China during that period of time is about carrying out its uh, project of economic modernization. Okay, while cleaning up the mess, they're being left by uh, Chairman Mao. Right. So in this sense, uh, a relatively peaceful world uh, is favorable for the domestic Hello. economic construction. Hello? Uh, yes? Oh. Hello? Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, yes. since the launch of the reform and open door policy. Okay, this very impressive economic growth, okay, being achieved by the country, okay, in terms of the double digit economic growth. Hello. Yes. Uh, can you guys all hear me? And see the slides? Okay. Okay, so uh, this uh, economic miracles are okay, being achieved by the Chinese government uh, after some four decades of, again, right, the launch of the reform and opening the policy has made the Chinese government to become more and more confident in terms of its unique economic model. Again, okay, this uniqueness of the so-called Chinese or China model of economic development is even being uh, uh, positively endorsed uh, by Western scholars, such as okay, this publication uh, <coughs> known as the Beijing Consensus uh, by Joshua Cooper Rambo in 2004. So anyway, uh, if there is such a thing uh, called the so-called China model, uh, perhaps okay, this could be understood as something like a country can become economically prosperous, okay, without becoming uh, liberal, uh, liberal democratic. So anyway, so this uniqueness uh, of the China model of development uh, in the eyes of the Chinese government uh, can be made or can be provided to the world as an alternative model, okay, an alternative political economic model, okay, 
particular for the uh, developing world, the developing countries to learn from. <coughs> okay, the third source of China's uh, soft power lies in its foreign policy. Okay, particularly important here, perhaps, is the good so-called good neighbor policy. So, accordingly, uh, there are three important dimensions uh, shaping this so-called good neighbor policy of the Chinese government. First is its efficacy of the so-called a multilateral world order. The second is about the emphasis being placed on the peaceful settlements of uh, disputes, territorial disputes with countries. Third is about the importance of establishing mutually beneficial economic ties with countries. So, in this sense, uh, this so-called good neighbor uh, policy uh, could be understood, uh, could be illustrated as Beijing's willingness to settle, or at least to alleviate its long-standing territorial disputes with nearly uh, its neighboring countries. So, in terms of assessing the effectiveness uh, of uh, China's soft power diplomacy uh, since 2007. Uh, can we say the soft power strategy of China is working? Uh, can it be deemed as successful? Uh, according, okay, according to uh, two very prominent experts on China, like David Shambo and Zhou Xinlai, uh, the answer probably is not that positive. Right? Or, or, uh, 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 assertive, right? For example, according to David Shambo, he was the author of the China Goes Mo uh, Global, right? This is what he said, like, well, right? I don't think we can fully pass judgment yet on how successful and successful China so far. Uh, public diplomacy efforts have been, but thus far, not very successful. They have not gotten much return on their investment. And by the same token, Joe Sinai, again, the, uh, the architect behind the soft power concept, also the author of uh, this, this book called Soft Power, The Means to Success in World Politics, he also argues that uh, the soft power diplomacy perhaps works a little bit better in, uh, in uh, the regions like uh, Africa and Latin America, okay, but definitely not so also very successful in its for its neighboring uh, countries. And in another way of assessing okay, the effectiveness of China's soft power diplomacy, uh, perhaps now we can look into some of the uh, data uh, that I have taken from the Pew Research Center. Uh, but of course, well, this uh, data is being collected before the uh, eruption of the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. But still, so far what we can see is uh, uh, what we can see basically here is uh, for most of the neighboring countries uh, among China, most of them are relatively skeptical about China. Right. And also in terms of uh, assessing uh, whether uh, China's economic development is a good thing uh, for the world. Still, what we can see here is the answer is somewhat uh, polarized. I mean, I mean, the opinions are somewhat polarized. Just some 55% of those see uh, China's economic oh. development as somewhat uh, beneficial for the world. And also here, this is also what we can see uh, figures or data has been collected in 2018. Once again, what we are seeing here is also some very divisive, also polarized uh, opinions, international opinions of China. Uh, again, right, with countries uh, seeing China's, uh, seeing China as a positive force, uh, Again, only countries like Russia, Nigeria, Lib uh, Lebanon, right? those are countries that we can see uh, having the most positive uh, ratings. But still, relatively speaking, or uh, comparatively speaking, uh, countries uh, in the so-called 
uh, advanced industrialized industrialized uh, world, uh, they tend to be a lot more negative uh, about China. So perhaps in this sense, uh, it is fair for us to conclude that this soft power diplomacy uh, being cultivated or being conducted by the Chinese government uh, since 2007 has not been uh, very effective, uh, not to mention successful. And now, okay, let us move into uh, this so-called uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, I think many of you again may be aware of this. Uh, the, the phrase uh, wolf warrior uh, had its origin uh, had its origins uh, in the in two uh, domestic uh, movies that have been produced in 2015 and 2017. Uh, the, yeah, the, the film is being named as Wolf Warrior. Okay, but my argument here is that uh, this so-called Wolf Warrior diplomacy uh, being conducted by the Chinese government okay, <coughs> did not emerge uh, in 2015 or 2017, but its origins could be traced back to uh, President Xi Jinping's okay, his so-called New Great Power Diplomacy. Okay, the essence of the so-called new great power diplomacy, uh, I would say there are three very important dimensions here uh, in terms of understanding uh, Xi Jinping's so-called great power diplomacy. First is about the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Uh, and this, again, as, mentioned, uh, as I mentioned this before, uh, the country cannot restore its status as a great power, or uh, the country cannot uh, carry out this process of rejuvenation without uh, the crucial leadership role being provided okay, by the Chinese Communist Party. <coughs> That's the first thing. The okay, second thing is rich nation, strong military. Okay, particularly important here perhaps is the two very important goals being set by President Xi. Okay, first according to President Xi, is to establish a moderate well of society by 2021. Again, second is about making China to become a so-called rich and strong socialist country by 2049. So 2049, as many of you may be aware of, this is a 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. So anyway, if there is such a thing called China Dream, a Chinese Dream, so, in the words of President Xi, this is basically about a rich and powerful country, okay, revitalizing the nation, enhancing the well-being of the people. So, okay, uh, in this context, what we are witnessing here perhaps is a very dramatic shift, or even we can say a fundamental departure, a radical departure of China's foreign policy tradition. So, if, for example, if we try to draw a comparison here okay, between the foreign policy making under Deng Xiaoping. Uh, uh, this is the so-called uh, slogans okay, being constantly chanted uh, by mm -hmm. the Chinese government okay, during uh, Deng Xiaoping's era. Uh, basically, uh, this foreign policy principles under Deng Xiaoping can simply be understood as, uh, I will summarize this in, in two sentences. First, it's about keeping China in a low profile while the country is busy with its economic development. Okay, second is about avoiding confrontation okay, with the major powers, okay, particularly the United States. So this, is, this can be understood as the uh, rationale uh, or the foreign policy direction of China under Deng Xiaoping. But what we're seeing here, the foreign policy uh, 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 rationale under Xi Jinping since he came into power in 2013. Four words particularly important here in Chinese, uh, 有所作为, so basically which can be translated as something like scoring some achievements, or it's about being assertive. So accordingly, in the eyes of President Xi Jinping, with uh, China has already become the second uh, largest economy 
after overtaking Japan uh, in 2010. Like if the countries, uh, if the country uh, recording some very impressive economic growth after some four decades of uh, uh, economic development. So right now, accordingly, in the eyes of President Xi Jinping, China has the capacity <coughs> or should be confident in itself in terms of being more assertive uh, on the world stage. And obviously, uh, this has some it is, uh, this has a lot to do, okay, again, with uh, President Xi Jinping is so-called China dream, or is so-called great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Because for him, the most important thing is about restoring China to the status as a great power like in the past, right? In terms of uh, ending the so-called century of uh, national humiliation, right? And that also explains uh, what uh, President Xi calls what he called this a new type <coughs> of major power relations. So basically the meaning here is China, since it has become uh, the so-called second largest economy in the world, so the country should now be seen with equal footing with other major powers, like, like the United States, for example. <coughs> so uh, now, as I just, as I have argued, um, this wolf, the, this so-called wolf warrior diplomacy did not uh, emerge in 2015 or 2017, but it has a lot to do, again, okay, with uh, President Xi's leadership style as since he came into power in 2013. So my argument once again here is that uh, this shift from soft power diplomacy uh, under President Hu Jintao to this wolf warrior diplomacy under Xi Jinping uh, did not just take place out of the blue. <coughs> uh, but instead, uh, I would say in terms of understanding the motives right, uh, behind uh, this launch of wolf warrior diplomacy under Xi Jinping is argument is uh, this can be understood as a logical extension uh, of President Xi Jinping's Okay, his so-called four confidence doctrine. Okay, this so-called four confidence doctrine, okay. uh, well, this is not uh, President Xi Jinping's okay. own invention, uh, but it was first coined by President Hu Jintao uh, during uh, his address uh, to the uh, National People's Congress in 2012. Uh, so, accordingly, according to President Hu Jintao, uh, the Communist Party, of course, the Chinese people as well, right, should have self confidence in China's uh, chosen path. Uh, the path here can be understood as the so called socialism with Chinese characteristics. Right? Okay, political system, uh, as well as the guiding theories. So, this is the so called free confidence theory being advocated by President Hu Jintao. Okay, but since uh, President Xi Jinping came into power, okay, he has added uh, the fourth element uh, into this uh, confidence doctrine. So, accordingly, uh, according to President Xi Jinping, uh, the Chinese people should also be confident in the cultural tradition of China. So, if, if we can just try and understand uh, the so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, this can basically be understood okay, as a logical extension of uh, Xi Jinping's in this so-called four confidence doctrine. Again, the, basically the meaning here is uh, China uh, should no longer okay, should no longer be that. Uh, weak uh, or uh, let's say uh, uh, submissive again to the Western powers, but instead China could become a lot more assertive, a lot more confident, exactly because of its uh, uh, economic uh, development, because of its economic power. Right? So, in this sense, right, uh, this so called move forward diplomacy. This increasing the aggressive stance being taken by the Chinese foreign, uh, Chinese foreign diplomacy could be understood as an expression 
or as a reflection of China's growing competence uh, on the age. And second is uh, this so-called foreign policy change could also be understood as part of the Chinese government's efforts to refute uh, the so-called very biased Western media portrayal of China. And so in this sense, it is very crucial for the Chinese government to so-called tell the true China story uh, for the people across the globe. So this is basically what we are witnessing here, right? Uh, in terms of China's uh, uh, response to the so-called COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Basically, what we are seeing here is, uh, in terms of understanding the Chinese uh, responses to the uh, COVID-19 epidemic, first is highlighting uh, China's uh, uh, highlighting uh, China's being a victim as itself. It's about victimizing itself, right? That China is also uh, a victim of this COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, second is about showcasing uh, uh, China's success in terms of uh, in terms of addressing uh, this threat being posed by the COVID-19 <laughs> by showcasing the effectiveness of its, uh, say, lockdown measures, right? And in many ways, in my opinion, this is also another way of a subtle promotion okay, of uh, the so-called China model okay, or the so-called confidence doctrine of President Xi Jinping. So in this sense, uh, seeing this in the eyes of a Chinese perspective, okay, the emergence of the wolf warrior <laughs> policy is <laughs> yeah, a direct response okay, to the so-called very unfair uh, approaches being uh, adopted okay, by other countries, especially the uh, United States. Okay, so here uh, I would like to make some very brief uh, concluding remarks, and other than that, I'm happy to uh, engage and answer any questions uh, on the floor. Uh, so, my some some very uh, brief concluding observation here is uh, for a very long period of time. Uh, with the Chinese Communist Party okay, being the only legal ruling party of the country, as I mentioned this before, uh, this, the legitimacy, uh, or we say the source of legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party uh, lies with the party's ability <laughs> to achieve uh, high-speed economic growth, okay, as well as uh, making people to become patriotic, or we say this is basically about uh, arousing the sentiments of Chinese nationalism. In many ways, right, this is basically what we can see, the essence of the so-called China dream of Xi Jinping is basically about an expression, an right, illustration of uh, mm -hmm. a Chinese nationalism. So, as we can see, with the Chinese economy slowing down, so you see the only source of legitimacy being left here perhaps is nationalism so in this sense it is very likely for us to see uh, President Xi uh, to conduct okay, uh, uh, an increasingly nationalistic foreign policy and so in this sense uh, this so called war forward diplomacy or the, the, conduct, the conduction of this so called war forward diplomacy Again, could be understood as a, as a uh, implementation of this nationalistic uh, foreign policy making of China. Of course, but you may uh, be interested in asking, what are the target audience for this move forward diplomacy? Obviously, the target audience are the domestic Chinese population. So again, this is about making the people uh, feeling proud of the country, making people uh, feeling patriotic. And in this sense, this is also about consolidating the legitimacy, okay, and thereby the uh, regime security of the Chinese Communist Party. So, in the future, I think it is very fair for it is fair for us to suggest President President Xi could become even more hostile uh, to the West. Uh, uh, particularly important here, perhaps, is uh, in terms of 
its ways of addressing the territorial disputes uh, with other countries. I think it is very unlikely for us to see uh, Chinese government and the President Xi to make any kind of concession, right? because this could potentially harm his domestic position. And so, in this sense, uh, I think it is also fair for us to suggest uh, President Xi's his resistance to Western culture and values uh, would intensify in the near future. In fact, uh, as many of you will be aware of this, right? Uh, Christmas, the celebration of Christmas uh, is being banned in China because it is being known as a Western, a Western festival other than a, 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 a part of a Chinese cultural tradition. So anyway, my, my final remark here is also is due to the political, ideological and cultural differences, uh, this uh, mutual, I mean the Western suspicion about the Chinese government and the anxiety about China's rise, and by the same token, uh, China's suspicions of the West, right, in terms of their plots of weakening or, or, or dividing China would not disappear in the near future. Uh, particularly, seen, uh, particularly because of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this would make this mutual suspicion and hostility even more uh, uh, serious and long-lasting. Okay, so this is basically what I would like to uh, share at this stage. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, your attention. And now I'm happy to uh, answer any uh, question uh, if you guys have any. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ramon, for uh, such a thought-provoking uh, lecture. Uh, so, we have already got the questions in the chat box. Okay. So, I'm, uh, so I'm getting into the questions. Okay, there was. So, the first question that I can see is from uh, Professor uh, Provi Kanti. Uh, he is asking that, do you have any uh, premonitory trend of encountering a Chinese warrior on your return to Hong Kong? Uh, do you run any risk of uh, uh, being? Uh, he's asking you that uh, whether you have any uh, pre-monetary sense of encountering a Chinese warrior on your return to Hong Kong. Uh, you mean the question being posed by Samitra? This one? How do the people of... No, no, no. Uh, above that, above that. Oh, okay. You came from the provincial country. Okay, it's... Is it that in the post COVID nineteen ambulance China is on the back foot? It's not likely to substitute Kushla with Trump in nineteen sixty to India with to the twenty twenty India. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in the field of China India relations. Uh, but perhaps what I can see, according to the best of understanding, is. In terms of understanding the escalating tensions existing between the two countries uh, in recent weeks, days, uh, 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 in recent days and weeks, it seems to me uh, this uh, escalating tension existing between China and India could also be understood basically as a, a, a logical extension of. Uh, the so-called wolf warrior diplomacy uh, being conducted by uh, President Xi. But of course, the, the, the irony, uh, we we'll say the ironic fact is, uh, you've got a chance uh, looking at the Global Times. So Global Times, that is the, uh, the, uh, the like, a, a, a official mouthpiece of the Chinese government newspaper called Global Times. Uh, it has kept denying that uh, what the Chinese government is doing now is move forward diplomacy. But instead, uh, what Beijing now doing is pointing its finger to the U.S. It is the U.S. who is conducting uh, the so-called move forward diplomacy. Uh, anyway, uh, this is the, qu the question about Hong Kong. Can you, can you repeat it again? Yeah, uh, the question regarding Hong Kong is that that uh, he is asking you that whether uh, you will be encountering a Chinese warrior on your return to Hong Kong. Uh, I think the, yeah, the answer is is a uh, is, uh, resounding yes. Uh, 
I mean, if you, if you, if, uh, if you guys uh, are following uh, the news uh, in recent weeks, so perhaps you may have noticed uh, the Chinese government has unilaterally uh, imposed a national security law uh, for Hong Kong. And the reason why I said it is a unilateral move, a unilateral move being made by the Chinese government is the imposition of this law uh, is being done through bypassing the Hong Kong's uh, Legislative Council. And according to the basic law, uh, the basic law is a mini constitution of Hong Kong since 1997. Uh, if you got a chance looking at Article 23, uh, what it says is the Hong Kong government, uh, or put the marker, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region government, has the constitutional responsibility to enact a national security legislation uh, for China. Uh, the Hong Kong government has tried this once in 2003. Uh, but it has ultimately failed okay, because of the large-scale protests. So this is over Article 23, less, uh, this is over Article 23 uh, National Security Legislation uh, could not be enacted uh, for some 17 years. So in this sense, uh, what we can see is the Chinese government is beginning to lose its patience over the Hong Kong people and the Hong Kong government. So that also partially explains why uh, now the Chinese government is unilaterally imposing uh, this national security law to the Hong Kong people. And this, in my opinion, could also be understood as a logical extension of the conduction of the so-called Wolf Warrior Diplomacy uh, to the Hong Kong people. Because basically the Chinese government uh, just uh, couldn't bother with the... Uh, uh, opinion, the public opinions of the Hong Kong people, because after all, Hong Kong is now being under the Chinese control. So basically, in the eyes of the Chinese government, one country is always bigger than the two systems. Right? So in this sense, uh, in terms of understanding uh, Chinese determination of, of uh, secure is so-called sovereignty and territorial integrity, so it is uh, completely legitimate for the Chinese government to make such a move. And so of course, in the eyes of the Hong Kong people, it is uh, uh, potentially very uh, dangerous because this is basically about uh, the Chinese government breaking its promise of the so-called one country, two systems formula. Because accordingly, uh, the Hong Kong will, re will remain unchanged for some 50 years. And at least until 2047. But now, the Chinese government is unilaterally changing this status quo. Yeah, and yeah, I hope I have answered this question. And, and the next one? Uh, next one is from uh, Dr. Shomindra Mohan Biswas. Okay. Uh, he is asking that uh, China is a dominant power in South and uh, Southeast Asia. In the event of China uh, withdrawing her investment, especially in Hong Kong and other regions, uh, how you would like to deal with the situation? And uh, he is also asking about the uh, what is the attitude of China towards the minorities in Hong Kong with regards to her uh, one country, two system policy. Uh, okay, I, I think yeah, as I just have mentioned, uh, this uh, the one country, two systems formula. Uh, is being uh, used okay, as a, like a transitional arrangement for Hong Kong after the transfer of sovereignty in uh, 1997. Uh, but as we can see, as I said, uh,
The electorate. If the Hong Kong people are still trying to fight for uh, the universal suffrage, you're being promised by the Chinese government. But so far as we can see, uh, the Chinese government uh, has kept delaying its promise. Uh, I mean, I mean, in terms of uh, denying, I mean, in terms of denying this universal uh, uh, suffrage, right? So the suffrage for the uh, for the aside the Chinese legislative council members in the Hong Kong. But so far as we can see, uh, in many ways, uh, the Chinese government uh, uh, has in this context delaying its promise. Uh, I mean, I mean, in terms of uh, denying, I mean, in terms of denying this uh, uh, universal suffrage, right? Some, the suffrage for the, uh, for the chief executive and the legislative council members of the Hong Kong. So, I think in many ways, uh, in the context, in this context, uh, with the Chinese government imposing its uh, national security law to Hong Kong, I would say uh, this is basically. Uh, the end, I would say, uh, the end of Hong Kong's democracy movement. Uh, and probably also, this is also the beginning of the end of the one country, uh, two systems uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, next, we have got uh, a question from Professor Prashant Kumar Sharma. Okay. So, okay. he's asking you that how do you uh, demystify the role of President Hong Kong yeah. legislator? which is well-trained in fighting with the Chinese authorities, even at times, the Chinese authorities is facing a vigilance over the pro-democratic people of Hong Kong. Very recently, the legislature of Hong Kong passed a law that criminalized dictatorship in China and France after the voices raised by the democratic leaders in the legislature. So how the people of Hong Kong is going to deal with the Chinese advocates? Okay. Uh... I mean, first of all, uh, as I said, uh, the Hong Kong people right now are still, uh, actually the Hong Kong people have been fighting uh, for this universal suffrage since the 1980s. Uh, but the, the current situation facing the Hong Kong people is, uh, first of all, the chief executive, uh, I mean the leader of Hong Kong, uh, is not being... Uh, democratically elected by the Hong Kong people through universal suffrage. And secondly, uh, the legislative uh, council in Hong Kong, uh, we call this a legal, okay, only half, okay, maybe 35 out of 70 seats, okay, uh, being uh, 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 pop popularly elected, or uh, directly elected, okay, through universal suffrage. So, the thing is, uh, with only half of those seats uh, being directly elected by the people, so it is actually very, it's, it's not difficult, I would say, it's not difficult for the uh, Chinese government uh, to have a full control of the Hong Kong legislature. As, as uh, you guys have said, uh, this, uh, in Hong Kong, again, in terms of understanding the political landscape of Hong Kong, uh, basically, uh, there are two political camps uh, which can be understood. The first camp is what can be known as the uh, pan-democratic camps. Uh, in short form, we call, that, we call them the pandems. Again, referring to those people uh, who are 
advocating for uh, greater democracy, again, in terms of uh, having the chief executive and the legislative council members uh, being elected through universal suffrage. Another camp is being known as the pro-Beijing camp. So this camp uh, is usually those okay, and who are siding with the so-called establishment, not the political establishment, the Hong Kong government, the Chinese government. And as you guys have said, uh, I mean, as, as uh, Professor has said, uh, a law uh, regarding this uh, criminalization of uh, uh, the, the respecting China, the Chinese national anthem has just been passed yesterday, actually. And the reason why this law was being passed is because um, most, the majority of the seats of the Legislative Council is being controlled by the pro-Beijing and the pro-establishment uh, pro camp. So in this sense, uh, this nothing much actually the Hong Kong people can do uh, at, at this stage because uh, given the fact that most of the seats uh, are being fully controlled by the uh, uh, by the politicians under the pro Beijing camps of course uh, we are now uh, we are actually having a, a legislative council election this September and some people are optimistic kind of optimistic that perhaps the pan democrats or the pro democracy camp can can try I mean can be successful in terms of securing half or uh, uh, more than half of the seats and they call this a 35 plus solution but of course when, uh, as we can foresee the chinese government would do everything it can in order to avoid this scenario to happen because in the eyes of the chinese government uh, having the legislative council being controlled by the pan democrats it's totally unacceptable because it is a threat uh, I would say that this is a threat to the uh, uh, sovereignty, or I would say even the regime security of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, one country, two system is it sustainable? Another question. And as I said, uh, perhaps I'm kind of pessimistic, I would say, but I would say pretty much I would say this is the beginning of the end of the one country, two systems. The reason is basically because uh, with the Chinese government uh, increasingly emphasizing the importance of one country other than the so-called two systems. Uh, and also exactly because of as I said, the unilateral move being made by the Chinese government in terms of imposing its national security law to Hong Kong uh, uh, by ignoring right, the, the, the basic law. Pretty much, it is. It can be seen as a serious uh, a violation of the one country two systems, because according to we got a chance reading the Article Twenty Three, uh, sorry, Article Twenty Two of the Basic Law. Uh, under no circumstances could the Chinese government interfere into the domestic affairs of the Hong Kong government. Well, obviously, what we are seeing is since 2003, or since the failure of the Hong Kong government to enact the Article 23 uh, Nas uh, National Security Law, uh, the Chinese government has become a lot more and more interventionist in terms of uh, tightening its grip over Hong Kong. So, in the long run, uh, I would say uh, this transition arrangement of the so called one country, two system. Uh, has become yeah, increasingly unsustainable, I would say, in, 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 in my simple and short uh, answer to this is, yeah. Okay, now is it, I can see another question. Do you think wolf power diplomacy is more viable today than soft power diplomacy? Uh, I guess if I understand this question correctly, uh, I think what uh, the audience is referring to is about whether uh, the so-called uh, rule forward diplomacy is, is more effective than the soft power diplomacy, is it correct? The reason why the Chinese government has, in recent years, has taken 
an increasingly aggressive stance. Uh, okay, if, if this is, can be known as the so-called wolf, wolf warrior diplomacy, is because this so-called soft power diplomacy uh, being cultivated by the Chinese yeah. government since uh, 2007 has not been very effective. Um, or in many ways, I, I, I would say, uh, exactly because of this ineffectiveness of the soft power diplomacy, I think, in many ways, uh, the Chinese government now is uh, giving this up. And exactly also, especially because of President Xi Jinping's his leadership style, uh, in his eyes, uh, I would say, uh, he couldn't be bothered, uh, he couldn't be bothered uh, with this cultivation of this soft power diplomacy because, very, very, because uh, obviously, uh, or say very easy and straightforward, uh, might mix right. Uh, so this is what I would say, uh, also the reason why, uh, exactly because of this uh, confidence, again, a full confidence doctrine, again, being advocated by President Xi Jinping. So China, in a sense, right, on the world stage, shouldn't be uh, that submissive or weak again it is crucial okay again right, for a very crucial message that the chinese government is trying to convey to to its domestic population yeah okay um i, I hope i have answered that question uh, yeah you have uh, you have answered all the questions now i have a question for you okay yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh Right now, uh, in the amid of this COVID-19, okay, so what has this impact on the democratic uh, movement of Hong Kong? The democratic uh, movement, I mean, how uh, because as due to uh, lockdown, okay, so I think there have been uh, some restrictions in your country also. So how, uh, so what has been the impact from that? Okay, sure. Uh, uh, see, okay, uh, first of all, uh, there has not been any kind of uh, lockdown measures in place in Hong Kong uh, so far. I mean, people had to enjoy total freedom to to go out and do anything. Uh, the only exception is uh, public gathering of four people or more uh, is being prohibited uh, currently. And this, uh, for the critics, okay, this is probably the strategy being used by the Hong Kong government to suppress the uh, protest movement in Hong Kong since its, since its uh, eruption uh, in June last year. And of course, right, uh, if, you, if, you, if you guys got a chance uh, 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 paying attention to the protest movement uh, in June last year, uh, that protest was basically Trigger by the Hong Kong government's attempt to uh, enact an extradition uh, 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 treaty uh, so that uh, criminals in Hong Kong could be extradited to mainland China for criminal proceedings. But of course, eventually, uh, this uh, extradition bill couldn't be done. I mean, the Hong Kong government has been forced to uh, shelter this bill, but uh, event, uh, but uh, I mean, increasingly, the in terms of uh, protesters' demand, uh, apart from asking the Hong Kong government to drop this bill, uh, they have uh, advocated something more. So. Increasingly, they are also referring to the, again, there's a, 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 a speeding up uh, the democratization process in Hong Kong. So even though just talking to the so-called five demands of the Hong Kong protesters, okay, one of those demands definitely is about the universal suffrage of the chief executive and the 
legislative councils members, right? And this pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, of course, has uh, somewhat uh, disrupted, has somewhat disrupted this protest movement. Uh, but actually, I think uh, I would say the protesters are starting to return to the streets. Because actually, we have already seen uh, small-scale uh, protest movements erupting uh, in Hong Kong in recent weeks. Uh, even though, as I said, okay, that so-called uh, 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 prohibition of public gathering of four people or more is still in place, but increasingly the protesters are ignoring, ignoring that, uh, 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 ignoring that. Uh, by returning to the streets. So, I think in many ways, I think uh, I would say, I, I think it is fair for us, fair for me to say, uh, the protest movements could be reignited uh, after the uh, virus subsides. And, but in, after all, I would say, uh, uh, the virus uh, is somewhat subs subsiding in Hong Kong because uh, for the past, uh, I would say, if, if, if I remember correctly, for the past 23 days, uh, there has, hasn't been any single case of uh, local transmission. So very likely, I would say, uh, the, the protesters uh, would return to the street and this uh, democracy movement uh, would be largely be uh, uh, reignited after the virus. And this could be a big headache for Beijing. For the Beijing authorities, I would say. Yeah, I hope I have yeah. answered that question. You will have a question in the chat box again. Oh, okay. So today we face a situation where the US leads an attempt to introduce democratic regimes in many parts of the world over COVID issues. Now, do you think democracy? can be imposed from about I think uh, what uh, if I'm correct if I understand this correctly what uh, the audience is referring to is about the democracy promotion democracy promotion of the US as, as uh, foreign policy tradition in the world uh, yeah he's uh, he wanted to mean is that that uh, do you think that whether uh, we can impose democracy okay um, from the above means i mean he's talking about that centralization tendency okay that usa is at the center and it is trying to impose democracy on other countries generally speaking i am not convinced that uh, democracy or democratic governance can be externally imposed. As we can see a lot of cases, say, in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? So in principle, I am not convinced that democracy can be externally imposed. Uh, but of course, uh, as we can see uh, in the current situation, uh, I mean, facing uh, the world, with U.S. being one of the uh, worst hit countries, right? I think what we're seeing here is the Chinese government has swiftly seized this opportunity to further uh, demonize, okay, the so-called uh, U.S. style or the U.S. version of democracy. Uh, for example, okay, in, in, in the uh, mass protests uh, recently uh, in the U.S., right, exactly because of the uh, George Floyd's death, right? what we're seeing is uh, the Chinese government uh, has seized this opportunity to condemn, uh, to condemn the alleged police brutality in the U.S., okay, at the same time, highlighting the relative uh, the relative uh, social stability of China. And in many ways, this, in my opinion, could also be understood as a subtle uh, promotion of the so-called China model. And, and I think 
in, yeah, in, in this sense, uh, this pandemic, I think, has uh, posed a very uh, a, a serious, uh, I would say, has posed a very serious uh, dilemma. Uh, I would say a very serious uh, problem for the U.S. because that has given the the Chinese, the Beijing authorities, to uh, say, yeah, to to as to so called to demonize uh, the U.S. Actually, this is the the phrase being constantly used by the Chinese government, right? Uh, uh, saying that the U.S. is trying to demonize China, right? Uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, Distorting a so-called peaceful rise, but right now what we're seeing is about the Chinese government demonizing the U.S. So this once again can be understood in this sense as a second, as a logical extension right, of this move forward diplomacy of President uh, uh, of the Chinese government under President Xi Jinping. Uh, okay, another one uh, uh, as China. Does not support one India diplomacy, so India is not liable to reciprocate one China policy, and the virtual participation of Minovsky, Lockheed, and the Rafael Aswan in the spreading in several in the time has. Uh, Rahul Aswan, not Aswan. Rahul Aswan. Uh, which one? Uh, that he has written Rahul Aswan. It will not be Rahul Aswan. It will be Rahul Aswan. I think it's a typing error. <laughs> Rahul Aswan. It will. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I think in in this sense, right, it is some seeing this in in the eyes of New Delhi. I think it is somewhat unfair, right, for India to support uh, the so-called One China policy, while at the same time China is not being uh, supportive. Uh, of the so-called One India policy, and I think in this sense, I think it is uh, uh, totally legitimate. Well, uh, it's fair uh, for the Indian government, for New Delhi, uh, to seek for uh, closer. Uh, Participation or even uh, 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 collaboration, okay, with the uh, uh, Taiwanese government or uh, the Taiwanese authorities, uh, because as I said, uh, like like uh, the audience suggests, right, this is somewhat reciprocal, right? You, you, I mean, you cannot just. Uh, I mean, it's not fair for for the Indian government to take the so-called One China policy for granted, and. I think, in this sense, I think India, in my opinion, uh, the Indian government uh, has the it stands to reason, okay, for 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 Indian government to stand firm, uh, or even say to stand up, um, yeah, against the Beijing authorities. At the same time, uh, 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 a, at the same time, fostering closer relationship with Taiwan. Yeah, this is. I hope I have answered that question. Yeah, uh, yeah. There is another question, and uh, take it as the last question, okay? Because we are uh, done with the time. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so take it as the last question. Is there an any distinction between the people and the regime? Aggressively nationalist and racist in China. Is that the the question? Uh, yeah, he is asking that whether uh, there is a difference between uh, the people and the uh, uh, there is, uh, and the, uh, the regime. That is the my the government were ruling. Okay, so I mean, is there any difference uh, between them? I think in the uh, if you see that uh, whether the people are thinking differently than the government in China. Oh, I see. Okay, I think uh, I will see the. Uh, So-called uniqueness and the uniqueness of the Chinese government is it is a party state. Okay, like so much of the meaning is the Chinese Communist Party, okay, like it being the only legal ruling party in the country, okay, is being equivalent uh, to the state, 
uh, that is the uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, so, I think in in this sense, uh, in this sense, uh, what is important, okay, in the eyes of the uh, Chinese government, is for the people to be supportive of both the Communist Party and country at the same time, because both the party and the country or the state, they are uh, inseparable. So that also explains why, as I said before, uh, this emergence of the so-called rule for way diplomacy, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, I mean, it has a lot to do with satisfying uh, the wishes or the needs of the Chinese domestic population. Again, this is about, as I said before, one source of the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party is about making people feeling proud of their country. And so in this sense, again, conducting this kind of nationalistic a so-called rule for real diplomacy could be very conducive. Uh, could be very conducive, conducive uh, in terms of uh, stirring up the, the Chinese people's uh, nationalist sentiments. It's about in, in the other it's about gluing the peoples together. But of course, this is being done at at the expense of alienating. Uh, countries around the world, as we as we have already seen, this this very aggressive move over diplomacy has already uh, backfire right, across the world. So I'm not sure, but but it seems to me this is something like a double edged sword. It's like a, a, a political gamble or President Xi Jinping, which very likely, in my opinion, that he will uh, he will lose in the long run. Uh, okay, uh, Professor uh, Ramon, uh, thank you so much for your uh, lecture today uh, and hope uh, that uh, we will get you in the future again back to, uh, if you come to India, so we will definitely like to have you in our college and uh, before that, uh, I think uh, we uh, can arrange some more programs uh, by online. So, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, so, so we, uh, with this, we will end for today, okay? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Maji, for yeah, once again for the very kind invitation, and also thank you for all the uh, participants uh, paying attention uh, to my lecture. I hope my lecture makes some sense. And yeah, and yeah, uh, you guys are welcome. You guys are welcome to to uh, keep in touch uh, with me if. if, if uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I would be happy to have to continue our uh, uh, to continue the dialogue and also further uh, engagement. Okay, if, if there is a need for that. So once again, thank you very much uh, for everyone for for your uh, participation tonight. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank, Bye. thank you very much. Thank you.